So uh, it is my pleasure to uh, kick off this um, uh, uh, work, uh, I guess, <clears throat> the breakout room uh, to discuss the challenges associated with um, bringing some of these technologies from academic areas as well as um, um, independent um, uh, companies to uh, the clinical settings, um, uh, especially for invasive and implantable devices. Uh, just briefly, uh, my name is Xu Li. I, I'm an associate professor of biomedical engineering at uh, Purdue VME here. Uh, I also happen to uh, have recently started a company. So this is also very uh, near and dear to my heart to learn more about uh, how to get our technology that we're trying to develop into the marketplace. Um, and I will introduce uh, briefly, and uh, if you can just kind of um, um, uh, introduce yourself, uh, we have uh, um, uh, uh, Dr. Mr. Malone from FDA. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. Um, my name is Misty Malone. I'm Assistant Director in the, for the Peripheral Interventional Devices and the Office of Cardiovascular Devices. My group reviews many of the peripheral stents and um, embolization devices and a variety of other devices. I've also been heavily involved with um, harmonization by doing and supporting international collaboration. And I guess my hobby is more of real world evidence and supporting the real-world evidence ecosystem and improving device evaluation overall. Thank you. Great. Um, next, we have Dr. Ram Iver from Cook Medical. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Just a thumbs up would be good. Okay, great. Um, I'm Ram Iyer uh, with Cook Medical. I've been with the company about 12 years. Um, I'd lead the a regulatory science uh, function uh, for uh, MedSurge, um, which is part of the, the products that are uh, dealing with the non-vascular side, but we do have um, plenty of implants even on the non-vascular uh, side of things. Um, so have um, experience uh, previously on the vascular space and have utilized that and translated that experience uh, onto the MedSurge side as well. So again, happy to share uh, the experiences uh, as well as uh, leading the discussions here. All right, thank you. And we have uh, Dr. Spencer King from Emory. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I apologize for being a bit late on here. I was on the wrong uh, breakout session, uh, but now I got it figured out. Uh, I'm uh, a clinician, I'm at Emory University. Uh, I'm emeritus professor at Emory, uh, but I'm still employed, I'm still working. Uh, my field is interventional cardiology I've uh, been involved in that from the beginning. I brought Andreas Grunzig to America to work with me in, at Emory uh, in 1980. Uh, and we began the interventional cardiology angioplasty type activities. So with that, uh, we've observed a lot of uh, device development over the years, been involved a little bit in some of those, but uh, mostly have learned uh, uh, the hard way about some of these things. We learned about uh, uh, IP in, in a difficult way. Uh, Andreas Grunzig uh, had uh, protection on his uh, balloon angioplasty, uh, but he published on it ahead of time, and so he lost his uh, patents. Uh, we've seen uh, technology transfer at uh, Emory University and you know, others uh, sort of flounder in the early days of various devices, and uh, we've been involved in uh, uh, starting up some uh, activities with some uh, companies. So I've been in, uh, uh, I'm also uh, representing uh, Nabil Deeb, who is uh, the person who introduced uh, this kind of program, I think, uh, with you at, at uh, Purdue. Uh, Nabil is, could not be on today. I, I'm involved uh, with him on the leadership of the International Society for uh, Cardiovascular Translational Research. And uh, my main work there is editing the book that uh, we use for uh, describing the curriculum uh, for uh, trying to navigate this pathway uh, to, to uh, device approval. Great, thank you, welcome. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Ken Kavanaugh from FDA. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Yes, I'm Ken Kavanaugh. I'm Deputy Director of the Office of Cardiovascular Devices in CDRH. Um, and uh, like Dr. Malone, I work also on some projects involving um, international um, harmonization, mainly from a, a review um, or evidence collection standpoint. But I'm happy to be here and always happy to hear 
um, other perspectives that we may be overlooking in terms of what, what components of our regulatory um, framework might be helpful to explain or just learn more about from the other side that we can we can potentially take on or find the right uh, partnerships in order to be able to make progress on. So again, excited to be here. Great, thank you. And I think we're still waiting for William Jung. Jung. Uh, so I'm gonna skip to Dr. Uh, Ronald Jean. Sure, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ron Jean. I'm director of the Division of Spinal Devices um, within the orthopedic group at FDA. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here um, and be invited in this discussion. All right, thank you. And I think um, Aaron just joined us too. Aaron, do you wanna uh, introduce yourself really quick? I think everybody saw you, but. Uh... Sure, thank you. Uh, Aaron Lattis, I'm a Associate Professor of Engineering Practice here at Purdue. Just looking forward to hearing all the discussion. It's great, and, and thanks everybody for joining too. And I apologize, I'll probably be jumping in and out of this session to, to pop in some of the others as well. Great to see all of you, and I, I'll see a couple of you uh, later tonight too. Fantastic. All right. So, and I have to say, um, Aaron and uh, Dr. Malone have uh, done a great legwork in actually framing our conversation. Uh, but again, this is meant to be an open forum for. You know, you guys to um, ask these experts in, in uh, regulatory sciences and clinical science uh, questions about, you know, challenges about implantable devices uh, and invasive devices, as you saw uh, from their brief bios, um, they have a, a, a wide variety of different expertise and they are uh, in charge of uh, evaluating a lot of these devices for different um, uh, indications. So um, uh, let's see. Um, the, uh, I guess the first part, um, I think um, um, maybe I'll uh, hand it off to Dr. Malone to discuss um, um, some of the challenges that we identified that are broadly applicable for this area. Sure, uh, thank you for that. Um, and my son is has an orchestra class behind me, you know, the joys of working from home during the day. So if you hear him playing, um, Please just enjoy. <laughs> so we're here today to, to talk about some of the challenges in the medical device ecosystem and helping and figuring out solutions to overcome these and to identify where either um, this panel has experience or what we can do to help overcome it. So one thing I appreciate about being part of these think takes is the opportunity to be candid in some of our concerns and have open discussion about how to move forward so that way we can learn from um, everybody here. And we at FDA like to hear uh, what's working well and what's working not, because if we don't hear um, those, then we don't know how to move forward in order to help you. So we were thinking today to start with some of the challenges. You heard many of them earlier in the previous discussions regarding um, capital or regarding device development. And with the panelists here, are there any challenges that you are interested in or that you see that we can discuss as a group? And I can lead off if there um, aren't ideas, but I'd like to hear from you first. So, so I'll just add, uh, again, it, it's, you know, the, the first thing is to the uh, part that Neil touched on uh, in terms of product selection. Um, it's something that we uh, have to think about uh, is the right type of product selection. Um, is it all products um, or is it, uh, you know, those key products and then start thinking about um, how to systematically go through that analysis uh, to make sure that we are taking those concepts uh, forward. So again, just that, that one piece in, in terms of uh, product selection and how we would want to be, uh, again, very pragmatic uh, with our approach. I'd, I'd kind of like to know whether uh, at FDA there's any uh, discrimination between uh, devices that things that are designed to really meet unmet clinical needs uh, as, as opposed to things that are uh, um, so, so, so many things that we that, that are developed are already out there and just small iterations. 
uh, it's, I guess, the reason we do so many uh, non-inferiority trials. But uh, from my perspective as a clinician, I wonder if there's any, uh, it's kind of like COVID shots. I mean, do you give any uh, priority to things that are designed to solve unmet needs uh, uh, over, over uh, other avenues? And I think the uh, warp speed is another, is another uh, kind of uh, thing that gives uh, those of us uh, who, who've watched things take a long time say, well, if we can do that with vaccines, why can't we do that with an aortic valve or some other things? So these are some thoughts I've had. That's good. You bring up, um, so it sounds like a lot of the question is device development and how can we do the right testing um, at the right time and not too much testing so that way you can bring the device to the market more quickly, more efficiently, and hopefully spend less money <laughs> doing so. Um, you may have heard Andy, uh, Dr. Farb speak earlier about the breakthrough devices pathway, which is for devices that many of these devices have an unmet need and they're meant to treat life threatening or debilitating diseases. And so it may not capture all of those unmet needs, but it does capture a number of devices. And then we have the safer technologies pathway, which will come out um, in March, I think March 8th, if I remember correctly. And this is for devices that don't meet the breakthrough criteria, but there's meant to, they're meant to be safer than existing devices. And both of those offer um, greater engagement with the FDA, consideration of the benefits and risk. And I would say from a reviewer perspective um, or at a manager perspective, we, whenever we consider the testing, what are the benefits and risks of your device? So it's very important to understand the risks of your device um, early on to develop a, a device um, testing plan. How are you going to, what strategy are you going to be using to evaluate your risks and the performance of your device and to consider the benefits and risks. So for these unmet clinical needs, one of your challenges, what is your comparator? Uh, what is medical practice? Um, and we offer opportunities at FDA to have those discussions. If you're in the breakthrough pathway, it may be a sprint discussion, which we try to respond to a single topic within 45 days. Or it may be, uh, if you're outside of the breakthrough pathway, it may be a pre-sub discussion in which we um, set up meetings or respond within about 75 days and many times earlier. So we offer these discussions to discuss this early, but I know some companies may be uh, scared to come to FDA early on. And are there other opportunities for companies to have these discussions with groups like um, um, CTSI or others in order to understand that strategy and de-risk the whole process? And I'll just kind of jump in that and, and, and just kind of uh, provide my perspective as someone who's just starting a company. Uh, and what you just said, uh, um, Dr. Malone, about being scared to talk to FDA is one thing that you hit, really hit it on the, uh, the nail. Uh, As Northwest on Wisconsin 59 West. Um, I, have, I have literally no idea exactly when it is appropriate to actually engage FDA or do we, can we do this in-house by ourselves by going through all the different document uh, guidance documents or is that something that we have to uh, invest some, you know, capital into hiring uh, an actual representative, um, some sort of consultant to be able to help us uh, guide through this uh, process. Maybe um, uh, you and other uh, from FDA can uh, chime in on this. Well, before before they do, let, let me let me say that I found this very interesting from a company perspective because I. Uh, I'm always advising people who have ideas uh, and who are doing trials, clinical trials as well, to, uh, to, to go to the FDA early. And uh, I've always thought that was the right advice. It's always been paid off for me. Uh, and I sent them to, to uh, Andy or to uh, Bram Zuckerman or whoever, one of you guys. And, uh, and I've never felt any fear of that. But as I think about it, I never, in most of these things was not uh, doing it from the perspective of a business opportunity uh, and, and worried about uh, 
being fearful. It always, to me, it was a, a, only a win-win situation to go to the FDA. So, so is it different if someone's starting with a, a startup company uh, going to the FDA? Is that is their is their risk greater than the risk for an academician uh, or some independent inventor going to FDA or somebody planning a clinical trial going to FDA? I can try to address that one. Others should feel free to jump in. I mean, I guess to to think about all those issues, the I can understand why maybe there's some feeling of risk associated with talking about FDA, right? Like maybe they'll, I don't know, something extra will be shared or um, the the recommendations may change over time or something like that. I mean, I can just say, I think the where we try to create the right environment, um, at least with our review teams is really don't, don't create an environment where you're discouraging the sharing of information. There's even if it's a matter of a company went through several device designs or, or several test protocols that they've developed and they found um, some failures with their device. Um, if there's a lesson that was learned from those failures, you know, if there was a, a device, a design iteration um, that was made as a result of that learning or they developed a, a better test method that more accurately was able to um, look at the performance characteristic that was considered more um, appropriate for success there. That's helpful for us to know. It shows that a lot of work went into this and that there was learning involved and we're not just dealing with um, something that really hasn't been fleshed out as fully. I think putting some context around all of that information can be really helpful um, for, for us at FDA to be able to make sure that we understand all that went into the, the device and its design and its intended use and all of that. And it also helps the team to learn, you know, down the road, they, they won't have to reinvent the wheel when, when similar issues come up either for this product, product or for other products um, like it. I think maybe to get to the second part of that, I mean, if we're thinking about bigger companies versus small, um, sometimes I mean, I get the sense with smaller companies, if they're, um, if they have somebody funding them, there may be certain questions they have, they want to be asked or they want to ask us or they need to have addressed other milestones they need to meet. Um, you know, I think we try to we have to focus more on the regulatory side of things. But if there if there are other conversations we can have um, within again that regulatory framework that are helpful for that company to help them make progress, to help them continue along the path. Um, sometimes those those make their way into our our pre what we call the pre submission pathway, um, and we try to factor that in as well. For a bigger uh, company, maybe they don't have as much of a concern there. Um, or there may be other parts of the organization that have gone through this um, process with FDA. We might, if we're aware of them, we may point them towards those parts of the organization and say, hey, if you talk to this group, this, this, there's some analog, analog in what they did versus what you're trying to do. We, it's, I think we've gotten a sense larger companies are much like FDA. We don't, we can't, we can't presume to say that we know everybody within CDRH or what they do. And from a larger company perspective, it seems like that happens as well. And so by helping orient, yeah, here's a group that had a productive experience there. Um, there were maybe some lessons learned. I think maybe we can, get, we at FDA can gauge the response we give um, appropriately and just find the right way to help them keep moving. Um, we, we try to help, but if there's other resources available that could help the company move along, we, you know, try to factor that in as well and uh, kind of create the right synergies that way. So I'll just add from the um, from the perspective of uh, the company. Uh, again, uh, you know, from our standpoint, we are um, attempting to do um, a lot of that thinking, uh, deep thinking um, internally first, uh, making sure that what are the questions that we would have, what are the residual questions that we would have uh, to uh, take it to a regulator uh, like FDA and and engage them in in uh, meaningful discussions. Uh, again, it's the same um, you know situation that we go through uh, for projects, depending on the complexity of projects. Um, and and it's not that for all projects do we um, you know say that yeah let's let's just engage FDA because there's some history associated with it. But if there are situations uh, that are different from a technology standpoint or even a a question, um, be it regarding non-clinical or clinical. Uh, we absolutely uh, encourage uh, that engagement, uh, again, just to make sure that we have um, all the questions answered and basically de-risk the project as, as best as we can. And, and Misty, Ken, Ron, I don't know if you want to give some comments on, you know, I'm used to going to FD for a pre-sub meeting where you have, like Ron said, you have a specific question or topic you want to discuss. 
Uh, but what about informational meetings? I mean, does FDA find those useful? When's the right time to go? Uh, you know, is that helpful for a, you know, for a small startup, even to just get familiar with who might be involved, who the right people are, uh, what they might be missing? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So in addition to the typical pre-sub where we answer companies' questions about their device, we do have informational pre-subs. Those are usually uh, either early on in the development process where you want us to get, want to provide us an overview of your device. It's particularly useful if you have a, um, a novel, an extremely novel device or a device where having hands-on and being able to use the device um, will help us understand it. If, if a picture is worth a thousand words, um, a video is probably worth a million and being able to play with it on your hands is, is worth a billion. So um, informational meetings have been really helpful for that, for us to be able to touch the device to if you come in person. Um, right now, virtually is, is pretty good too. Um, I typically tell companies that if they want to send a video of your device so that way we can understand it. You don't have to meet us in, in person for us to communicate and engage and provide input. So having either video conferences or teleconferences in which we can engage, understand where you're going, what you're thinking. And usually during the informational meetings, it's, it can be more of a presentation or you can be open for a discussion. We typically can't answer all your questions during that time because one thing we like to do, um, we try to do during the pre is be consistent with similar devices, with our other OHTs. So it's not just answering on the spot. You want to be able to use the information and um, trust that that information will be uh, still hold later on. So the informational meetings are useful. Um, we also have other types of pre-submissions once you get to FDA. We have submission issue meetings. If you receive a, a letter and you don't quite understand what we're asking, we will meet with you to explain that. We don't want um, we don't want to be the get me a rock <laughs> and we want you to understand what we're asking so that way there can be discussion around it and we can understand where you're coming from. So there's lots of ways to engage with FDA. What's come up a couple times is how early to engage. Um, I found the most useful discussions are once you have a understanding of your device, the risk, and you have either a basic strategy um, of how you plan to evaluate it either bench, uh, animal testing, or clinical, but not, not quite at the PhD thesis level, more at the, the next step where you have um, the, you've developed a prototype and you're ready to move forward. And FDA, we like to engage on those type of devices. They're uh, especially novel devices. It's interesting. It's exciting. We want to see it develop just like you. We want it to be brought to patients and help patients. So as, as Dr. Cavanaugh said, don't be afraid to share information with us because we are here to work with you to get it to the stage that we can um, help the public. This is Ron Jean. I, I just have another comment to add. You know, I think uh, what Misty mentioned in terms of early engagement is very important. And, you know, we're, we have multiple sort of scenarios where we've seen a company come in very early, we've given feedback and they've tweaked their design and they come back in. We treat it more like a dialogue. Um, but there's an entire division within CDRH dedicated to industry and consumer education. So I would definitely encourage anybody who, who is starting out for the first time on this journey to visit uh, that resource. Their acronym is DICE. Um, and within DICE, they actually have an uh, online resource called Device Advice. And, you know, you can get lost in there and, and you know, some of it does take a deep dive, but that's a really good um, sort of first start to familiarize yourself with some of the terminology and processes. Um, you know, another word of advice I would suggest is, you know, try to try to hone in on who exactly you need to speak with at FDA. Um, if you go to Google and you type in CDRH management directory, you'll come across sort of the whole list of the management and, and organizational structure. And, you know, it, it's important to sort of try putting out some feelers so you can figure out who you actually need to talk to. Case in point, I work in the orthopedic office. Um, 
And you know, our group is the division of spinal devices, but if you're actually dealing with anything affecting the nerves or modulating the nerves or stimulating that, that goes to a completely different group um, in the neurology office. Um, and similarly, we work in spine, but if you're dealing with uh, sort of uh, non-implant devices like braces, that's gonna go to a physical medicine group in an entirely different office. So um, definitely engage early, check out the Device Advice website and uh, try to navigate to who your appropriate contact is. And you know, we do our best within FDA if we, we get an errant uh, message from somebody, we try to connect them with the right point of contact. Right, that's great. That's a very good start. Let's um, cover one of these um, questions we had from Nina. Uh, I think we talked, touched on this a little bit. Um, she's asking about the breakthrough technology designation. Um, how early should you engage with you uh, at the FDA? Um, uh, especially if they know the risks and benefits of the device uh, and they know what already exists and what the current uh, practices are in terms of clinical treatment, uh, what would be the best way to approach them, uh, approach FDA, if, um, even if the clinical trial is years away? I mean, I would say, I guess, again, just my thoughts here, but I would say that um, as part of the, the, I guess, the evaluation of the, the merits of the breakthrough device argument, um, we definitely would want to know what the, what the intended use would be, you know, understanding why that would be um, a, a population that would um, benefit particularly from um, a breakthrough type device. I think we would also want to have some understanding of the technology involved, um, as well as the um, wh why the, the belief is that the this treatment would be more effective than existing um, therapies. Now, if there's not anything out there, that may be an easier argument than if there is. And in some cases, the way that that, um, that benefit could be shown might be technology dependent. Sometimes that can involve uh, uh, actual test data, um, whether it's other clinical data that may be available, or it could be bench data, or it could be just a kind of a theoretical argument. Um, again, it's a little bit hard to be specific since a lot of it would be situation dependent, but um, what we really say is, I mean, once you've really locked in on what you think the, the patient population would be and what the, generally what the device design would be, enough to know what the, what the particular risk to the key performance characteristics would be for that therapy, um, that would be a good time to at least reach out, um, maybe informally at first, of using the like the organizational chart uh, that Dr. G mentioned. I mean, maybe to find the right assistant director for the team you work with. And if you don't know what that team is, um, they'll put you in touch with the one, the right one. I'm mean, just say, hey, does this sound like a good, would this be a discussion that's worth everybody's time to have now or would it help to have more information? I mean, I think just kind of being open. We understand that there's a lot that we, a lot of dialogue we can have before the clock officially starts on these submissions. Um, we try to do as much of that as possible to really increase the, the quality and the efficiency of the discussions we have once the submissions come in, because we know that can be an important trigger for, for many companies as well. But again, just my thoughts on that would welcome opinions from others, or if there's other, any other, I guess, considerations you think that should be kept in mind when thinking about the right timing um, or pace of these kinds of discussions. Let us know, uh, Nina, um, if that answers your question. Uh, feel free to uh, uh, unmute and chime in as well. Um, I, I guess uh, I wanted to kind of maybe a step back and I, I, I tell my students all this time, all the time, uh, just, um, just be able to ask, you know, even if you have um, some silly question, but for, from my perspective, you know, we talked about different kinds of um, requests for meetings and conversations with FDA, but maybe can you um, highlight some of these uh, methods uh, because from my perspective, it seemed like you have to go through the proper channels to be able to do this, um, file this request, and then wait for a response and provide information and then wait for response. Or is it as casual as e finding you guys' email and then sending you a quick email about you know, how to potentially um, classify the device or designate the device or something like that? Before the so there, trigger, actually, she's going to answer that, uh, Misty. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, let me say that I, I was going to try to find out what the real concern is about uh, the risk of going to FDA. And the next question might get to that a little bit. But uh, I, I, I would say 
the answer to who, who to go to is important, find out who to go to, but the uh, feeling that uh, you have to have every uh, T crossed and every I dotted to, to before you go in there, I think is wrong. I think that the, my experience is that the FDA has been very uh, interested to uh, talk to you. So I, I'd like to understand what the le legitimate fears and concerns are about interacting with FDA early and, and what what's the downside? What's the risk if there is one? I mean, I would say the, I wouldn't say there's a risk. It may just be the time might have been better spent on something else. For instance, if the design changes or the intended patient population changes or new information becomes um, available. I mean, if it's more just very, very early and it's, hey, we have an idea here, we haven't really locked in on a patient population or a design, that's really where maybe the informational meeting might be more helpful. Maybe there's some general discussions we could have that can then help inform more specific regulatory strategy. Um, so, I mean, I think that's the, the, I don't think the conversation would like poison FDA on the technology or anything like that. I would say it's more a matter of if the recommendations we provide at that time are likely to change later because of um, other decisions that the company has yet to make, then we might just suggest, okay, we, we, we can provide our feedback now, but would it be better to hold off until more of the, the planning or the development aspects have been finalized? That, I guess, I would see as the main um, risk from a, from a company's perspective. That, that was actually my concern. I saw there was, Dr. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I saw there was a question about, you mentioned the RFD, request for designation. Um, I, I haven't seen um, as many of those as in my group as maybe other groups, maybe because um, our cardiovascular devices are, are well known or they are more comfortable coming to us. Um, there are opportunities to discuss that under pre-submission. It's not a decision, but it's, we can have that open discussion. And um, in requests for designations, you can provide that big picture. It's not just simply, here's my device, here's, here's uh, what, I, what classification I think it is. You can have a um, discussion there, and if needed, we can have a meeting to discuss it. But um, some of that discussion can also be done under pre-submission. So there's not a fear of coming to us. We will do our best to give you an answer based on the information that's available. If the information changes, the answer may change also, um, recognizing that we're always learning more, iterating, and evolving. Gotcha. That's great. So it sounds like the starting point is a pre-sub request, meeting request. Does that sound like a good idea? It, it's one idea. Um, you can come to us. I, there's the, I'm curious um, with some of our industry participants when they would may go to uh, consultation or find others or what other groups they may reach out to to gain input. As I've heard it's challenging to know who to go to. Are there um, repositories or sites or groups that you go to in order to gain feedback either prior to FDA or do you just jump straight to FDA? I'll chime in from a startup perspective. So recently I uh, received an NSF SBIR phase one award and the program manager um, was advocating that we go to the FDA and engage in a pre-submission meeting. And I found it to be a fabulous experience. But before I just jumped in and did that, I engaged with um, a regulatory science group to begin that conversation and to begin learning the regulatory science process. And so I do think for you know, those of us who are coming out of academia and doing this for the first time, it's important to um, engage with those around us in our community. We've got a number of uh, regulatory science groups that, um, you know, and, and, um, and, and Med Institute is, is one of those um, that you can consult. But then um, moving forward and as you, you know, put together your information and your, your uh, biocompatibility plan, you know, don't be fearful about going to the FDA. It was a tremendous learning experience. We actually, I've actually engaged in three pre-submission meetings around our innovative technology. 
That's great. Thank you, Sherry. I, I did not know that. I should have asked you first. Um, the, 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 uh, the, I had a question uh, in terms of pre-sub uh, meeting, a pre-submission meeting. Was there a um, the user use fee for uh, um, requesting a meeting for uh, with FDA with that process or no? It doesn't seem like there is. Okay, gotcha. No, the cost the cost is significant from a standpoint of um, taking in a regulatory consultant alongside yourself, right? You, <laughs> I, I went in and I made sure that I had someone that was well versed in the medical device realm um, along my side. I think that's very important. Gotcha. Great. Um, so uh, I guess um, moving on, I guess we'll talk about some of the other challenges Misty had um, um, identified. I think we touched on, you know, the topic that um, I personally was really interested about not really understanding the uh, regulatory pathway and how to actually do the engagement. Uh, but she also identified, um, you know, not understanding uh, the risk of devices and uh, patient population, understanding, I guess, uh, what the, uh, the patients need. Um, do we have uh, potential uh, questions along those line? Um, not really understanding what is clinically done, uh, not getting uh, enough uh, feedback from the, the patient population from the rest of the field. That's an area I, I, I really would like everybody to weigh in on. I, uh, Purdue, you're, you're a, a school, engineering school, right? You're, you're the people mostly on this call. And uh, we've previously, uh, taken these uh, efforts from the International Society for Translational Research uh, to medical schools. And what I find is that uh, engineers are sort of aimed at device development more than, than, than uh, clinicians. Clinicians, on the other hand, are complaining about this doesn't work and we, here's what we need and here's the problems we need to solve. So, you know, I, I'm always hopeful that there's a collaboration uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, get get the ideas from each other. So, and, and even we've had this program uh, at a law school as well. Uh, lawyers are interested in these uh, subjects as well. Uh, so what's the, uh, uh, within, for, for instance, within the uh, Purdue uh, uh, School of Engineering, that's not the name of it. What, what's the name? The, uh, uh, it's the College well, of Engineering. Weldon, Weldon, okay. Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering, actually. I, I'm, I'm sure Weldon had, had uh, I, I want to pay homage to Weldon, whoever he is, because he probably made a major contribution. But uh, uh, in, in that, in your organization, uh, uh, is there any uh, cross-pollination with uh, med med uh, medical people who, who uh, you know, have ideas that usually are preoccupied and uh, this is my personal uh, experience for many years of doing this, that uh, I, I think I've invented everything in my sleep, but never get around to actually doing thing much with most of those devices. Uh, so uh, you'd almost say, well, if I had an engineer sleeping with me or nearby, I would uh, have benefited greatly. So the cross-pollination, the, the interaction is I think important. I absolutely. I mean, I can tell you from uh, my perspective and, and from um, the department's perspective, uh, Purdue BME is definitely, uh, I guess, uh, we recognize the need for clinical input. Uh, so we, we um, and myself included, um, work uh, really well with a lot of our colleagues at IU School of Medicine. Uh, they provide us with a lot of information about clinical needs and what kind of tools are necessary. So I think those two things are um, uh, really um, working well so far, it's just that when I, I am just getting into the uh, process of trying to take some of these things into um, the, through the regulatory process and getting, raising money and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the next stage of how to go about doing that is, is challenging. You know, um, I, I guess uh, we could get additional consult, consulting to deal, uh, address uh, the regulatory pathways and things like that. Um, 
we just don't have, I guess, uh, a lot of um, uh, network or just guide guidance about how to, you know, not just take the good idea that are clinically driven, but to get to the next space uh, of um, who's going to actually run with it. Sherry, do you 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 showed you showed yourself? Uh, do you want to chime in on this topic uh, briefly? I'm or? living I'm living that right now. It's very challenging in terms of bringing the necessary team together, finding the funding while maintaining your day job. So <laughs> it is daunting, um, but when you are driven you know, to, to help patients, it's something that you do. I wanted to ask the panel about the Early Feasibility Device Clinical Studies Program and if there's best practices or criteria that you look for when allowing devices to move down that um, pathway. And then, and one last thing that I'll bring to that is, what about cancer patients? So originally we had, were developing uh, a technology, while well, we still are developing a technology that ultimately we feel can benefit um, breast cancer patients as a in-situ scaffold forming collagen, right? And when we went through our pre-submission um, meetings, we found out that, of course, cancer patients are high risk. Um, they, have, they bring high risks as, as a patient population. Are they, you know, are they off limits in terms of these um, early feasibility studies or can you speak to that a little bit? So I can try to start the answer there. So as far as the early feasibility study program goes, um, I, mean, I think we have our guidance document available. I wouldn't, that lays out how the program works. I'm not necessarily sure it would provide you like a cookbook for how to go through each of the steps in early feasibility or, you know, what other, uh, what other dynamics you'd need to keep in mind in order to get a, like a site up and running. Um, my understanding, others may know about this, is that the um, Medical Device Innovation Consortium, MDIC, um, has a initiative going on to help uh, the medical device industry with early feasibility studies more broadly across the whole spectrum, not just regulatory, but also on the, the clinical side or maybe the business side. Um, they may have resources as well. Um, otherwise, I mean, I'll just say for cardiovascular devices, I think we, we've gotten used to spending a lot of time on that. We know it's a, it's a program that's um, really energized uh, medical device development in this country. Going through our experiences, they're saying, hey, here's maybe the, here's the level of information that would be appropriate to have for an early feasibility study submission. Here's some recommendations for how to present some of this information, not to bias the information, but more just to make sure that the information that should be in there is in there. It's an IDE submission, like for a clinical study, like any other, we only have 30 days to review them, um, calendar days. Um, and so we recognize it's important for those uh, to be in the best shape as possible before they come in. For early feasibility studies, oftentimes those are smaller companies, they may not have, have as many uh, shots at getting those studies approved. And so we try to work through um, as much of that as much as we can. That's really where pre-submissions become very important. Um, from the from the second part of that, for cancer patients, for cardiovascular, probably doesn't come up very often. I do we I know we do as a as an agency, not just as a center, as an agency. We have a oncology center of excellence, um, and um, projects that involve cancer may get. I, I honestly can't speak to what the tangible benefits of that might be for. Um, a company coming in, but I, I can tell you it is something the agency pays um, a bit more um, attention to than say the average therapeutic area, just because there is a concerted effort across the agency to try to, are there are common approaches we could use there, common tools, whether they're diagnostic tools or evaluation tools or anything like that. Um, maybe more something like the diagnostics group would know something more about, but um, that I can just say from an agency standpoint is there has been some coordinated effort to promote the development of um, diagnosis and, and treatment um, of cancer. Others may know more. I was gonna speak more to um, your comment, are those patients, um, uh, we, we stay away from them. And I, I don't think there's a patient population that we necessarily stay, 
are off limits, but more of an understanding your device when you choose these, I, granted, we want to treat the really challenging patients, but having those in your clinical trial in your clinical study may mean there's more variability. And so we may not, may not be able to isolate uh, the performance and safety of your device from what the patients are experiencing. And then we see this with some patient populations with um, extremely high blood pressure, with really, um, with diabetic feet, ulcer, feet ulcers. And so what can we do for those patients? You want to study them. And so there may be opportunities to design your clinical study so that you have sufficient power in order to understand what your device is doing, but also understand what's going on with those patients. So that's where discussion with the FDA will be extremely important. Identifying the right time points so that you can understand um, the effect of the device above the noise. So some of those, you may hear certain patient populations aren't included in trials so that we can understand the device. And then there's opportunities to study those patients either as a second arm or post-market. Uh, so I was going, I, I was trying to um, focus on that part of the, the question. And before we get too far away from early feasibility studies, I didn't know if you saw the question um, from Melanie Raska for you, Ken, about harmonization by doing and um, uh, EFS studies are also available in Japan or an EFS-like study. Right. Sorry. Yeah. The way I have my screen set up, I can't see that corner of the Zoom window, so it's not easy for me to see when chats pop up um, without moving my head around on camera. But um, I will say that um, it's something that we've talked about through harmonization by doing um, before. We CDRH has developed an early, a formal early feasibility study program, um, whereas there really isn't anything like that in Japan, at least not formally designated. Um, as such. Um, however, we've, we've talked with, um, with companies who are interested in early phase clinical research in both countries. What could this look like? You know, is there, is there experience from the U.S. that may be informative um, for those in Japanese um, PMDA, their, their analog to, to, to FDA, to, to hear about and learn from? And I mean, I can think of at least one company who was able to get such a study going. Um, again, early phase clinical research with um, a different level of evidence provided in order to to get that going. Um, again, no formal program there, but I think through through the Japanese consultation program, they're able to find the right balance there. Uh, I mean, this is about U.S. development, but I'll say that my experience with the Japanese government is they are thinking through some of these same issues. There is a very fertile ground there for a medical device or other therapeutic product development um, from the academic side, and just trying to think of the way to get those products to market is very important for them. There's not as much of a startup culture there. And so how do they, how do they accomplish that in, in that type of environment? Um, and their government is also trying to think about how to do what's in the best interest for you know, all stakeholders in that space as well. So I found them to be open to these kinds of discussions. They may not be able to formally designate a, a program um, um, that, that lines up perfectly with ours, but they're, all, they're definitely willing to think through, okay, what, what could satisfy the, the spirit of um, meeting the regulatory bar for starting a study or getting a, a product out there. Um, so, yeah, definitely something encouraging. If anybody, if they're interested in that, I'm always happy to, to follow up. All right. Um, so I'm going to move on to the, uh, the next challenge uh, that we haven't uh, really discussed yet, which is to uh, really find um, uh, and re remediate uh, any in a, in a inadequate or incomplete device valuation for, you know, the risk associated, especially with high risk associated with implantable devices. Um, I think, um, you know, we got, we got a, a lot of good feedback about how to engage the FDA early to kind of get an idea about how to potentially design and de-risk and make sure you understand the, um, the problem um, and the patient population. Um, I, I, I was wondering in terms of, um, um, uh, demonstrating safety and efficacy, there's different stages there, you know, you do preclinical studies and you do clinical studies. Uh, um, in terms of preclinical studies, do, do you, does, does the FDA also provide guidance as to um, get to get guidance into, in terms of how, to, how much data you require before you actually get to um, ask for a clinical study and things like that? That's a good question. Um, regarding the animal studies, we do review the animal studies and we'll also provide input early on on your design of your animal study, recognize those that 
those can be extremely costly, costly and time consuming. So you want to do it right the first time. We do provide input. Um, we also, it, whether an animal study is needed, um, one, one uh, and, uh, Dr. Fard mentioned for early feasibility studies may be appropriate where an animal model isn't um, available. And so we see that in, in some spaces that like such as the valves, um, treating critical limb ischemia in these patients. Um, there may be some other animal models that aren't available. So doing an early feasibility study, having some information to suggest that your device will likely be safe, um, we, we can start in a few patients, especially if there's an unmet clinical need and these patients are willing to tolerate the risk. So it's that benefit risk um, discussion early on. Uh, we do have some guidance on animal studies, some general guidance, and then within our test device specific guidances, there's also some additional guidance on the expectations. But typically, we'll see that in pre submissions. Or any other thoughts or best practices on how to go forward with an animal study, recognizing that they are costly? Well, Misty, do you give advice on whether they're going to need uh, GLP labs to do this? And 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 secondly, is at at the uh, at Purdue is the is there a GLP animal lab there or, or do you collaborate with one? So I'll, I'll just jump in um, the second uh, question first from Purdue perspective. As far as I am cons I know there is not a GL. Well, actually, that's I take that back because I think we do collaborate with some other companies to do animal studies in the building at at the vet school, but I'm not positive whether it's GLP certified. Sherry, do you, do you have the answer for this? Um, I have a, a historical perspective. And, and so we have excellent preclinical study team. Um, and you have the opportunity to interface with outside groups that could come in and assist with a GLP study. As far as the, perp, I mean, for consultations as to whether a GLP animal study is needed, I mean, yes, we can talk about that. I, I as you mentioned, we have a, a guidance document that talks about animal studies um, and really the role of GLP in doing those studies for in mean, thinking about the phase of research. If it's something that's early feasibility, we can talk through, okay, what, what rigor is important there, especially if we're uh, thinking if we collectively anticipate that the device design may change later, um, it, you know, if, if the device design is relatively locked in, maybe it makes the most sense to do something that won't run the risk of needing a new study um, later because it wasn't up to GLP equivalent standards. I mean, discussions like that, I think our animal study reviewers um, are routinely involved in the issues of GLP um, GLP quality, I guess, of, of animal study protocols and results and, and talking through that and really, again, trying to find the right balance, the balance for what's needed at the right time and making companies also aware of you can take a more, a simpler approach now, a less rigorous approach now, but that might mean more work to be done later um, and helping companies understand maybe the trade-offs in, in, in what approach to take at, at a given point in time. For many of us, for what uh, Ken had mentioned, because in spawning, you know, a lot of our hardware, um, you know, the, the primary criteria for starting a study is preliminary safety. And, um, you know, most of that testing is conducted, uh, you know, on the bench fatigue, um, testing, developing SN curves, and, you know, emphasizing early engagement again, that's really critical because, as Ken mentioned, um, some studies we can peg as preliminary safety and you can conduct the more rigorous studies in parallel with the clinical study so that that arrives and is completed by the time that you're ready to submit the marketing application. So, um, you know, again, uh, it's just another good practice to engage us early, see what needs to come first before your clinical and what you can delay or conduct in parallel um, for your actually marketing authorization application. So while we're on this topic of um, asking guidance from um, study evaluation, um, 
I want to ask uh, um, about cases when there's really no similar or equivalent um, predicate devices. Um, I think um, uh, uh, there's de novo uh, a pathway uh, for those types of devices. Um, I think, uh, and also, especially given you know the increasing complexity of implantable devices, uh, increasing number of combinational devices. Um, what are some of the best practice? Again, I think it applies to everything, but um, what are some of the best practice for engaging uh, FDA uh, and trying to understand what you know, evaluations are needed to guide this process through? Similar to the other discussions, uh, pre-submissions <laughs> help a lot as part of those discussions. Uh, we do have individuals that meet, may reach out to us early on and say, look, I want to submit a pre-submission, but I want to make it the most valuable uh, for both uh, the company and FDA. So what should we consider? So we do ha sometimes have some of those informal discussions when resources allow, um, but usually under pre-submission. So if there's no if there's no predicate, it may be de novo or it may be PMA or uh, another pathway. Um, sometimes there is a predicate available. It's just hard to find, and we uh, we're expert in our, our narrow area, and so we'll usually try to find the right team to get it to so that uh, the submission to. So pre-submission is a good way to figure that out early on, and then um, if more information is needed, you can discuss additional pathways later. But yeah, there, the the no predicate. Um, I, I believe it was either Jeff or or Dr. Scherner, uh, Dr. Farb, who mentioned we've been trying. FDA took an effort to make the de novo path um, more efficient by in using timelines. Um, we have guidance. We we provide more input um, on that, and we're trying to be transparent on the pathway. You are creating a predicate. And so there may be certain criteria to um, meet in order to d create that predicate, and then it's easier for other companies <laughs> later on. So we do typically work in, in collaboration, and uh, we engage early when possible in order to make the path efficient. Great. Um, so... So feel free, uh, the, field, the rest of um, the audience, um, jump in with questions and uh, comments uh, as well. Um, and you can always revisit some of the topics we already discussed. Um, I think the, the key takeaway, one of the key takeaway is to engage with FDA early. Uh, have no fear of asking stupid questions because uh, there's no, uh, <laughs> I guess, history remaining that you asked us a good question. Um, so the next challenge I wanted to highlight that uh, Misty also um, uh, uh, brought up was not considering uh, expectations and coverage um, for the, the device that you are trying to get this through the regulatory process. That's a especially tough one and I would love to hear you guys' um, feedback, uh, especially, I guess, potential examples of devices you guys got gone through through the uh, res regulatory process, but ultimately have to fail because nobody actually paid for it. I'm sure there's several examples of this, otherwise, you would not have brought this up. Um, so how, how, you know, maybe this is something that the FDA folks and, and other uh, panelists can potentially discuss how to engage with uh, potential payers um, and uh, you know, to get the approval um, to be on the, the, the list of um, approved um, um, payments and things like that. I might tell you just some, I've been around so long, I can tell you some historical notes that are maybe instructive because uh, back in the uh, early 80s, mid 80s, uh, we uh, made several suggestions. We were beginning to be interested in, in restenosis after angioplasty. So we came with an idea of delivering drug into the artery wall and uh, we, conceived the idea of a, a, a porous uh, balloon that could ex exude a uh, drug into the wall of the artery. Uh, so I can tell you that we didn't know how to do anything at that time. And so 
our response was we're always connected to the major companies uh, who supplied us with catheters and so forth. So that one, uh, I think we went to Cook, as a matter of fact, or, or uh, Cordis, Cordis. And uh, there it does uh, language forever. And, and 30 years later, somebody finally comes up with something like that, <laughs> that uh, it works. Uh, another one was uh, when we first started with stents in the uh, 85, in 86, uh, I had a patient from uh, Boston who had founded the uh, Whitehead School of, uh, uh, at MIT and uh, bioengineering uh, department. And uh, he, he suggested we get hold of uh, Robert Langer. You, you were talking about bio, uh, 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 matrix, matrix for uh, growing tissue and everything. So we did, and he put us on to another fellow at Rutgers. We came up with a uh, biodegradable stent idea, which never got much past being a, like a drinking straw, biodegradable materials, different materials. Uh, again, that idea uh, ended up at Medtronic and still buried in the basement somewhere. Uh, different ideas, we, our idea was, you, if you had an idea that seemed like you, you may fiddle around with a little bit, but usually it was gobbled up or thrown away or protected by one of the major companies that, uh, and uh, never to be seen again, or seen in a later version, but without uh, I, IP protection or any of that. So people are a lot smarter nowadays. I mean, you're talking about those of you who are starting uh, startup companies and and it took me a long time to learn that the major uh, manufacturing, ma major companies don't really, uh, you know, invent things. They just buy small companies that have already done it. So I think uh, we, we learned that uh, we were involved in the brachytherapy, trying to prevent restenosis. And with that one, we did go to a smaller company and they did develop it and it was successful. But uh, my, my advice is uh, is learn how to do the startup uh, operation <laughs> and find all those pathways to get it done. And then when you're, and, and because of that, you get, you, you got to find ways to get it through not only regulatory, but uh, uh, reimbursement uh, through uh, venture capital, through, uh, or, or some kind of funding. And uh, from the bioengineering, one of the big blockades for the clinician, if you had the clinician from uh, Indiana University or somewhere uh, who had a good idea, uh, they've got a good idea. They've got no a way to build it. And you've got a way to build it. And you've got a way to say, this could work, that couldn't work. By the way, here's a different way to go about it that might work. That, that's why I think uh, we need to foster the, the collaboration of clinician and uh, engineers. To, to get to, to get to the point where you got a mouse trap now it's hard to figure out how to get that mouse trap all the way through is an issue but the first place you gotta come up missy said she'd like to have it to play with it in her hands well if i think it up you, you're not you're never going to get that so unless somebody makes it for me Yeah, and I'll just I'll just add, uh, Misty. Sorry, I'll just add from the standpoint of uh, you know importance of regulatory strategy. I think the key is also reimbursement strategy to be uh, developed early on uh, because again, um, you know if you go along the the landscape and and develop a product, do clinical studies, and and then identify that it's not going to be paid again. Uh, it, the the gap is that reimbursement strategy not fully fleshed out and. Uh, if, if there could be some additional requirements to obtain reimbursement, uh, that needs to be factored into your uh, clinical plan. So again, you're uh, you know building that uh, from the get-go rather than uh, trying to wait on that uh, at the end. So again, thinking about uh, the strategy and de-risking, not just um, you know purely regulatory, but also these other commercial aspects, uh, especially around reimbursement, is, is extremely critical. That's actually exactly what I was going to say, is thinking about it when possible early on. 
Um, there are consultations at CMS and maybe with some of the other payers that you can speak with them regarding the endpoints, the time points uh, that may be useful to them. So that way you can build them into your study. Um, I would hate for you to get FDA approval with a study of 200 patients and you need 250 to get through the payers or um, to have an additional endpoint at six months in order to get through the payers since um, they're looking at uh, clinically relevant endpoints in for the, the patients. And so it's important to think about that early because it may seem like a lot more upfront, but it may end up being more efficient in the long run to have one study that answers both questions or um, not just with uh, FDA and payers, but even globally, how can you incorporate uh, those those questions early on, so that way you can get the biggest bang for your buck. Oh, and FDA does have uh, a pre-submission, uh, I wouldn't call it a pathway, but we have early payer feedback in which you can, it's, it's on our webpage if you look for that, um, that you, we, you can bring payers to your pre-submission. And there's a discussion and they'll, they'll weigh in on what they think at port endpoints, what they may consider, uh, valuable information to collect. Um, it's not used as, as often. I haven't seen it used as often as, and, as I'd like, but it may be of interest to you to pull in some of the payers. And on our webpage is a list of payers that are interested. Yeah, that's a good comment. Um, you know, in the spinal device arena in the last decade, I'm only aware of two companies that have pulled in their payers to have uh, uh, pre-meeting discussions with us. So it, definitely is underutilized. Um, some good news though, you know, if you can afford a regulatory consultant, I know that some of the firms have an integrated package where they do consider sort of the regulatory um, as well as the payment um, issue. So um, they're kind of a one-stop shop. I was thinking that, uh, I mean, there's a, there has been a collaborative effort, hasn't there, with the FDA and CMS uh, to have parallel tracks for uh, so that you don't have to wait till you're totally approved by FDA to start trying to get your reimbursement done. I mean, this was this was a huge issue with the aortic uh, uh, valve, percutaneous aortic valve, as you know. And, and I thought of, uh, so to to get to that. I mean, does, does FDA? How would how would the uh, the investigator or the inventor or the who are small company, how, how would they uh, approach that? Uh, uh, I know we have chapters on that in this uh, ISCTR involving CMS uh, authors about it, but I, I'm not remembering who you go to first. How do you how do you meld up your your CMS your your reimbursement questions with your regulatory questions? So you come to FDA to so ask that question. Can you tell yeah, me I mean, who's going to do that? Right. I think that the discussions can happen either um, sequentially or in parallel. I don't. I think my understanding, just based on my experiences here, are CMS probably has less resources devoted to like these types of like coverage decisions than FDA does for marketing or clinical study approval decisions. Oftentimes, in my experience, we, we work closely with them, but if there's experience that FDA already has in that area, there's some other perspective that they aren't aware of, they appreciate hearing that. Um, so maybe like some joint discussion involving FDA and CMS can be helpful um, in that sense. Um, if, you, if you decide to start with CMS first, if for whatever reason reimbursement is the piece you wanna figure out first, um, you, that's, there are certainly companies who who, who do that, we you know, we find out about it a lot uh, later and that's okay, but they can talk through with CMS and get CMS's thoughts on what the issues are. I do feel like sometimes CMS will say, okay, FDA, well, you've, you've looked through this study before, you've seen devices like this before, what, what do you feel like um, helps establish a determination that a given um, procedure or therapy is reasonable and necessary, kind of like how we look at safety and effectiveness, they look at reasonable and necessary. Um, they don't always, we don't always agree on that. They may have a different view. They have to think of their, their population there. It's the Medicare beneficiary population. That may not be as relevant for all therapeutic um, areas, um, 
but I, I do think having the discussion can be um, helpful there. And we, we, we have some good relationships. We have some people who have a foot in, in both agencies, so to speak, who can help ha facilitate those dialogues or find the right people who, who need to be um, involved in order to, to again, get a, get a manufacturer what is helpful for them to know in order to, to move forward. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. I guess my, my short answer for that is it, there is not one specific way to do it. Um, there are multiple ways where we can have this conversation. We can each bring each other in um, at the right step along the way. Well, that's, uh, that's a very enlightening. I did not know this uh, about um, CMS, um, their requirements for approving something like this. Okay, Dr. Ash, I think she has got a um, uh, hands raised up. Do you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to point out that there's also pretty great marketing risk uh, when there's really one payer for the service and uh, policies from CMS and preceding uh, uh, agencies have been pretty capricious at times and uh, variable. Uh, just as an extreme example, HICFA in the old days in the 1980s uh, was paying for home helpers for hemodialysis, uh, 15 bucks an hour, I think. And there were about 4,000 home hemo patients. My uh, company, HemoCleanse, brought out its first product, a, a sorbent based single access home dialysis system. Got FDA approval in 86 and in early 87, HICFA eliminated that program. And 4,000 home hemo patients went to 400 left at home. The market disappeared and we had to change directions radically. Uh, <clears throat> more recently, uh, there's been a huge push to get people back in home dialysis, uh, the AKH, Advancement of American Kidney Health uh, Presidential Edict. Uh, came out uh, hoping to have 80% of home of patients in 19, 2025 uh, on start on home dialysis. And yet home hemodialysis is very effective, uh, is done with short daily or uh, frequent treatments four or five times a week optimally. And CMS still has huge restrictions on paying for any more than three treatments a week. So, uh, that plus uh, the bundling. Uh, you can be pretty sure that if there's any technology that's not gonna advance, then uh, it, uh, toss it into the bundle, which means it's considered part of regular care. Uh, so all of these things, I'm not saying they're wrong decisions and uh, the push might be in the right direction. It's, uh, it's quite a uh, variable landscape uh, when you only have CMS as a, a provider. Any comments? Um, is it is it uh, so? Is it is it typically the CMS approves and then all the other private insurance follows, or do you, do you sometimes uh, in, engage uh, the other private ones and maybe potentially uh, VA uh, and then do the uh, the opposite way? No, I, that is the the general uh, case. CMA first, and then everybody follows. Uh, however. Uh, hemodialysis or uh, ESRD, as you know, is the, the, I think, about the only disease-specific group of patients who automatically are covered by Medicare. So even though private insurance is involved, it's involved for at most uh, three months to a year, and then it's all, it's all CMS. ALS is another one. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. Rare. Thank you. I was trying to think of the other one. Uh, that, I think those are two, right? That's it. Yeah. Gotcha. So, you know, again, it's what's important is to is to learn what the trends and plans are of CMS. So usually, uh, given way in advance, but it's never clear if they're actually going to get implemented. And then, uh, is there a way to talk to them? I mean, that's I guess that's my next question. Is there a way to to approach CMS and say, is this approvable from your standpoint? That sounds like a, a great topic, a focus for our next year's uh, breakout discussion on reimbursement, because uh, this is something that I have very little knowledge about. Uh, not that I have a lot of knowledge about the uh, the regulatory system. I think um, David Chadwick, you want to um, you, you want to unmute yourself and um, ask a question. Yeah. 
Sure, thanks, you. Um, first, I wanted to comment that early on, you said it uh, feels a little fearful interacting with FDA. Um, two of the three FDA people that you have online, I've interacted with a lot. It's always a two-way path. Sorry, Ron, we just haven't interacted, but the future's coming. But, you know, uh, I would say Misty and Ken have always been approachable. If you're working in their discipline area, don't go to them with the Ron's arena. Probably they won't be that helpful, but they'll steer you there. But I wanted to ask a different question. Um, Misty, you sort of said you're becoming a real world evidence nerd. My word, not yours. I knew that wouldn't upset you too much, but can you talk a little bit about um, real world evidence and data, how, how you're seeing it in your group, um, label changes, or how do you feel about, we don't need a human trial prospective. We've got the real world evidence data, maybe out of Europe or somewhere that we can lean on that for a submission. This is personal, not a cook question. Thanks. It, it, thanks, David. Uh, yeah, you can call me a real world evidence nerd. Um, I think there are a lot of there's a lot of positives and challenges and opportunities for uh, using real world evidence. Our real world evidence infrastructure, unfortunately, isn't ideal. Um, there's a lot of information missing. There's a, a lack of definitions and harmonization across multiple sources. And so that's where, um, at least I hope, I've been collaborating with multiple groups in order to help improve those areas. Because once we have an infrastructure that we can trust, we may be able to use it in uh, more studies in the future. So it'll be important to understand if you do have real world evidence from the US or Europe, what is the quality of that information? Is it audited? Um, it's important to understand the definitions and the amount of missing data. And I could go on and on and on, but I don't know <laughs> if we have enough time. So when using real world evidence, this is one time I will, will say definitely come to FDA, discuss your plan up front. Um, we recognize that much of the data may be retrospective, but if you can make your statistical analysis plan, if you can plan it prospectively, that will provide some level of confidence in the data. Uh, understanding, it's important to understand the definition. So many times using real world evidence takes a deep knowledge of both of the device, the clinical space, and the um, registry or so data source you are using. So it may take a little bit more homework than say planning a, a clinical study. It doesn't sound like it, but it, it may. Um, yeah. I found real world evidence useful, especially for hypothesis generating, understanding your endpoints, understanding what is missing. And in my group, we've used it for labeling changes, um, supplementary data. And as Dr. Sharon mentioned earlier, we're hoping to publish a report of 90 examples. They're not comprehensive. They're not all the uses of real world evidence in the center. But these 90 examples extend across all of our clinical areas. Um, our submission types, a variety of sources, registries, medical charts, EHRs, and other sources, and, um, and across a, a variety of uh, use cases. So is the data the primary data set? Is it supplementary? Is it post-market, pre-market? And it, um, in one case, it was used to identify patients because it was a rare patient population. So they were able to go to a registry and identify patients. So there's a lot of use um, for real world evidence. And I am hoping that in many years, it'll be even better. So we have to work together in order to build that infrastructure. Thank you. So we all know that clinicians are allowed to use a device how they want to use a device. What <clears throat> referred in the FDA world off label. Um, is there any feeling that you that's come through the agency of application of some off-label type device to expand a population or is that a, a fair way to come forward maybe or stay we've had yeah, it, the label expansion but there's yeah, probably other about, about post-market surveillance in this regard because you, you i mean fda has been more open i th think in recent years to mm -hmm having post-market surveillance built into the applications. Is that right? 
And I will, I will just jump in and say, if you could um, uh, address Anthony's question, I think it's relevant here as well to kind of um, uh, discuss post, post market uh, analysis uh, in terms of approval process with um, Dr. King's and Dr. Chadwick's um, comments. I, I can try to handle um, some of that. So I think that there's, I think one thing the center has done over the past several years is think about different types of post-market surveillance mechanisms and try to, to work with um, companies and in some cases other groups about the right, the right tool for the job there. Uh, the traditional FDA mandated protocol driven post-approval studies, those were generally limited to on-label use, which really limited the ability to obviously collect off-label use that could be used for other purposes. Over time there, um, you know, I think, um, like a, a aortic um, aneurysm, uh, stent crafts is one example. Um, percutaneous heart valves is another where post-market surveillance evolved a little bit from that kind of protocol-driven evaluation to more something that's medical society-driven. Um, we, FDA, expect you to collect a certain amount of information on the use of this device through some other mechanism. And that other mechanism was established and had other purposes um, that also allowed for off-label use. Now, if, that, if those data were collected as part of that process or really any other process um, about some other indication, um, just because it's, it's off-label um, and didn't, maybe wasn't collected under an ID doesn't necessarily preclude you from using that data for other purposes. Um, so I think that those, those examples of, of using data, like kind of thinking ahead as to what other, like, maybe gaps in the expected patient population um, that aren't covered by currently approved indications could be filled in has been an important part or part of the learning process and regulatory process um, for us. So I think we're trying to think of, I guess, different, what kind of question do we think needs to be answered post-market? First of all, it's what needs to be answered pre-market, then what's important post-market? And second, what is the right mechanism for identifying that or addressing that question and then tailoring maybe the conditions of approval that way or thinking what other stakeholders should be involved in that discussion to make sure that as much as possible, we're not just um, satisfying an FDA post-market regulatory requirement, but we're also answering other clinically important questions. We've learned really there's a lot of other uses for this information, a lot of other existing um, mechanisms for collecting this information. Can we leverage those as much as possible. Um, so we're not just setting up one thing for this one purpose um, that won't be used later. Yeah, I would say that um, you can see from some of the strategic initiatives in CDRH that registries are really a focus. And even within orthopedics specifically, um, we have an orthopedic co coordinated registry network that we um, sort of participate on. And we, we really see value in the future with these registries to really collect, you know, a lot of information that we can then go back and data mine and potentially, um, uh, you know, use some of that information to drive some of our pre-market decisions. Uh, really quickly on the, the question in the comment box, uh, you know, in terms, in terms of our current structure, we are a, a TPLC environment right now, meaning we have pre-market, post-market, and compliance all within the same uh, group. Um, but in terms of sort of, uh, you know, quality systems, um, we really only address that pre-market, you know, if, if there's a, a real dr driving reason for a 510K we do it in PMAs, we do it in HDEs, not so much in de novos. Um, so um, the application kind of drives the surveillance unless there is a, a critical reason, but it, it's not unheard of that if there was sort of a routine inspection uh, post-market that somebody could be issued a 483 warning letter for violations um, to their quality system or for some other uh, reason. Hopefully, Anthony, that answers your question. Um, can we briefly uh, touch on Mike Walls' question about the resources for a startup? I'm not sure whether we have the expertise here, but do you, have you um, had any experiences um, trying to evaluate the payer, uh, I guess, possibilities, um, especially when you're at an early stage startup? I mean, that also is very uh, relevant to my needs. So, so if, um, you know, even beyond the panelists, if you have any thoughts and experiences, please feel free to share.
All right, so sounds like that uh, topic should definitely be reserved for next year's uh, breakout meeting. Um, all right, so I think we're coming up on our time. Um, is there any other final thoughts uh, from, from our panelists? I want to mention really quickly one new challenge that we're coming up with. Um, COVID-19 has played a bit of a havoc with how clinical trials are being run and um, the resources that are available. So that may be one challenge <laughs> that you should think about because I'm not sure when we're going to reach a um, normal again, and it may be a new normal. So whenever you are thinking about your device and think about the use space and how it's going to be used, um, in our current clinical world and also thinking about um, how your device will perform in the patients nowadays, if any things have changed in your patient population based on COVID-19 um, or the influence, other influences of the pandemic. So that's one new challenge that we didn't have a chance to talk about, but we'll see what's coming of it in the future. All right, well, uh, that's a very nice parting thought. Thank you, Misty, for leaving us with that um, thoughtful um, discussion. And um, um, let's please uh, give uh, the panelists a round of applause if you can um, unmute yourself, maybe potentially do, do this. Uh, thanks for spending your valuable time with us and uh, you know, enlightening us about all the different processes and uh, being able to uh, lower the comfort level of uh, threshold for us to reach out to you. Um, so uh, be expecting a lot more uh, um, um, context from the rest of us. All right, so we'll meet you guys back in the main um, conference room. Okay, thank you.